Hello, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in today for our first public workshop on the 2022 state strategy for the state implementation plan, or as I will be referring to it for the rest of the presentation, the 2022 state SIP strategy. Bueno, muy buenas tardes a todos, eh, todas. Bienvenidos a nuestro taller sobre la estrategia estatal 2022 para el plan de implementación estatal. This workshop represents the beginning development of the 2022 state SIP strategy, and today's discussion, along with future ones, will help inform and direct the 2022 strategy. Bueno, y este taller orientará la dirección de lo que sería la estrategia para el Estado, tanto este taller como los siguientes se enfocarán en esta orientación. We are offering Sp Spanish interpretation for the webinar today, but this is only available if you are participating through the Zoom application. Estamos ofreciendo interpretación al español esta tarde, pero solamente si están participando a través de la aplicación de Zoom. We will be activating this momentarily, and once we do, everyone participating on Zoom will need to click the word interpretation with the globe found at the bottom at the Zoom window and select the language you would like to hear, English or Spanish. Esto estaremos activando en breve y para ello pedimos que seleccionen interpretación que está localizado al pie de la página con el icono del globo. De ahí puede seleccionar el idioma preferido, sea inglés o español. Even if you will continue to listen in English, you must make the selection in Zoom. Incluso si solo escucharán en inglés, sí deben hacer esta selección dentro de Zoom. Without selecting a language, you will hear no audio during the webinar. Al no seleccionar un idioma, no oirán audio durante el webinario. To hear only Spanish, please click mute original audio. Y para escuchar solo el idioma interpretado de español, seleccione silenciar audio original. Thank you, Ryan. So I need to. Okay. And we're back. As I just mentioned, there is a call in line available if anyone has connection issues or prefer to call in by phone. As can be seen here, an access code is required. Also, as I mentioned previously, Spanish interpretation is not available by phone. We will be taking questions during one break in the middle of the presentation and then again at the end. We will be accepting these questions through the Zoom application for those of you for those of you online today, both through the written Q&A function and verbally using the raised hand feature. We will also take questions via phone and we'll ask you to raise your hand on the phone using the number two. Once we get to your questions break, it will already in order to make sure we are able to get through the presentation, we plan on only taking written questions through the Q&A during the middle break in the presentation. And then we will hear and address all additional comments and questions at the end of the staff presentation. Please feel free to send us your written questions throughout the presentation and we will address them in the order after we conclude. We want everyone to know that this webinar is being recorded and will be available online later. As such, please note that questions you ask verbally or write to us will be part of this recording and part of the public record of this webinar going forward. Please know that these slides are available in both English and Spanish on our website at arb.ca.gov 
slash resources slash documents slash 2022 dash state dash strategy dash state dash implementation plan dash plan dash 2022 dash state dash zip dash strategy. If you go to CARB's homepage and use the search function to search 2022 state SIP strategy, or even type CARB 2022 state SIP strategy into Google or another search engine, you should find it. We at CARB are happy to have this opportunity to speak to you and to hear your initial feedback in response to today's presentation. Before we really get into things, we'd like to introduce the team here at CARB for the 2022 State SIP Strategy. I'm Austin Hicks, and I work in the Air Quality Planning Branch and lead on the development of this strategy. Thanks, Austin. I'm Ariel Philibai. I am the manager over the um, South Coast Air Quality Planning section in the Air Quality Planning um, Division at CARB and uh, manager over uh, the lead for this state SIP strategy. Hello, my name is Sylvia Vandersbeck and I'm chief of the Air Quality Planning Branch and um, I oversee the development of the state SIP strategy. Hello everyone, this is Sam Portozeri. I'm the Chief of the Mobile Source Analysis Branch at the California Resources Board. I oversee the scenario development for the Mobile Source Strategy and the State SIP Strategy. Hi everyone, uh, this is Fang Yan. I'm the Manager for On-Road Mobile Development Section uh, in Sam's branch. Uh, our section is leading the scenario analysis of on-road uh, emission scenarios. Hi, uh, my name's Dave Edwards. I'm the Assistant Division Chief in the Air Quality Planning and Science Division. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Benjamin, and I'm Chief of the Air Quality Planning and Science Division at CARB. Thanks, everyone. For our webinar today, as you see here, we'll start by going through the background and purpose of the State Implementation Plan, known as the SIP and where the state SIP strategy fits into the picture, and then move into an overview of the progress made since the 2016 state SIP strategy. We'll then provide an overview of potential measures for the 2022 state SIP strategy. The 2022 state SIP strategy will also include an economic analysis and CEQA environmental analysis. We will then finish off with the schedule of deliverables over the next year. Now, diving into the background on SIP from the science-based health effects of ozone to the requirements of the Clean Air Act and the 2022 state SIP strategy. Ozone is a gas composed of three atoms of oxygen. It occurs both in Earth's upper atmosphere and at ground level and can be good or bad depending on where it's found. Ozone at ground level is a harmful air pollutant because of the effects on people and the environment and its main ingredient in smog. Ground level ozone is what is known as secondary pollutant. It is generally not emitted directly into the air, but is created by chemical reactions between two precursor pollutants, oxides of nitrogen, NOx, and reactive organic gases, ROG. This chemical reaction occurs when NOx and ROG are emitted by sources and react in the presence of sunlight. Ozone in the air we breathe can harm our health, especially on hot, sunny, stagnant days when ozone can reach unhealthy levels. Depending on the level of exposure, ozone can cause respiratory symptoms, worsen lung disease leading to premature death, and damage lung tissue. The Clean Air Act identifies ozone as one of six common air pollutants known as criteria air pollutants. The Clean Air Act requires US EPA to review scientific research on health and welfare effects associated with the exposure to criteria 
air pollutants like ozone every five years. The resulting assessment serves as the basis for making decisions about whether to retain the existing level of the standard or to revise the standards to be more health protective. In 2015, US EPA revised the eight hour ozone standard from 75 parts per billion or PPB to the more stringent and health protective level of 70 PPB. After US EPA revises a standard, the state recommends areas that do not meet the standard and US EPA takes into account those recommendations when they officially designate areas as not meeting the standard, also known as non-attainment areas. In 2018, for the 70 PPB standard, US EPA designated and classified 19 non-attainment areas in California based on the most recent air quality data. The map to the right shows all 19 non-attainment area boundaries and classifications with criteria areas having been updated since their original classifications. States are required to submit SIP revisions for all areas classified as moderate or above. The following slide will talk about one of the required SIP revisions, an attainment plan. Of the 19 non-attainment areas in California, nine areas are moderate or above and will have to develop and submit attainment plans as revision to the SIP. Attainment year depicts when they must meet the 70 PPB standard based on their classification. Each non-attainment area attainment plan is required to include a demonstration showing they will meet the 70 PPB standard and other planning elements based on its classification. Attainment plans must include both the magnitude of emission reductions needed and the actions necessary to achieve those emission reductions as part of demonstrating attainment of the 70 PPP standard. The actions necessary to achieve those emissions reductions or control strategy are taken by the agency that has jurisdiction over those sources of emissions. We will discuss jur jurisdiction more in a few slides, but an attainment plan can include emission reductions from CARB and the local air district for each non-attainment area. CARB's emission reduction measures and commitments are developed through the state SIP strategy. The 2022 state SIP strategy builds upon previous state SIP strategies and CARB's regulatory efforts by including additional measures and commitments to reduce emissions from state regulated sources to support attainment across the state. It is important to note that SIP efforts in California have contributed to dramatically improved air quality over the decades. For example, from the 1950s through the 80s, there were many days when we couldn't see the length of a city block in some areas of the state. Children were kept indoors during recess because of fear of what it would do to their lungs if they were allowed to play outside. People exposed to the hazy clouds suffered from eye irritation, respiratory problems, and nausea. Air quality in California has greatly improved since CARB was created in 1967. For example, Southern California now attains the national standard for nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Ozone peak concentrations have been cut over 70% and hours of exposure reduced by 90%. Particulate matter annual levels are cut in half and toxics have nearly 50% risk reduction. Even with all these efforts and reductions, additional progress is still needed to meet the 70 PPB standard. 
The table again shows the nine non-attainment areas and associated classification. But here we're showing the measured ozone concentrations known as design values. The design values are based on three years of data from air monitors calculated according to US EPA requirements and show the air quality improvement needed to attain the 70 PPV standard. As we look towards attainment, attaining the 70 PPB standard, we must look at each non-attainment area design value and develop an attainment plan that will bring the area into attainment. The graph shows those same 2019 monitored design values and how far each non-attainment area has to go to attain the 70 PPB standard. Each attainment plan will include emission reductions from CARBs programs and respective air district programs, including new commitments as needed for attainment. Additional emission reductions uh, will need to come from the federal government as well. The responsibilities to control emission sources are split between the federal, state, and local governments. CARB is responsible for controlling emissions from mobile sources, except where federal law preempts CARB's authority and consumer products, developing fuel specifications, establishing statewide control measures for air toxics, providing technical support to local air districts, and overseeing local air district compliance with state and federal law. US EPA has primary authority under the Clean Air Act to control emissions from mobile sources like interstate trucks, aircraft, marine vessels, and locomotives. US EPA also has oversight authority for state air programs as they relate to the Clean Air Act. However, because of California's unique and widespread air quality problem, California may require greater control of emissions from many kinds of mobile sources, and, and thus the state may, and thus the state has many standards and programs that are more stringent than their federal counterparts. The state is divided into local air districts, which are also referred to as air pollution control districts and air quality management districts. These agencies are county or regional governing authorities that have primary responsibility for controlling air pollution from stationary sources. Collaborative partnership is key and many areas in the state will need reductions from all jurisdictions to meet the 70 PPB standard. To further emphasize the need for additional progress, and collaboration with all jurisdictions, we wanted to take a look at precursor emissions in the state's two extreme non-attainment areas, starting with the South Coast. <clears throat> the following graphs is a snapshot from our current baseline emissions inventory. The baseline emissions inventory only includes adopted control programs and not any future ones. The graphs include NOx and ROG, the two precursor pollutants that form ozone. NOx and ROG are split into three different source categories, area-wide, such as consumer products and agricultural burning, stationary, such as petroleum production and industrial processes, and mobile, such as passenger vehicles and locomotives. These three sources are estimated over three years, 2018, which is the base year, and two future years, 2031, which is the extreme area attainment year for 75 PPB ozone standard, and 2037, which is the extreme area attainment year for 70 PPB standard. Due to existing control programs, emissions of both NOx and ROG are decreasing from 2018 to 2031, as can be seen in our baseline inventory. But after 2031, emission reduction rates are less significant in the baseline inventory, though the, um, 
baseline inventory through the 2037 attainment year. Let's take a look at another extreme non-attainment area. The San Joaquin Valley is also an extreme non-attainment area for the 70 PPB ozone standard with an attainment year of 2037. The emissions inventory for San Joaquin Valley shows the similar story as South Coast and that NOx and ROG decrease from 2018 to 2031. But after 2031, there are less emission reductions in the baseline through 2037, 70 PPB attainment year. In addition to the emission reduction trends is the fact that mobile emission sources make up a significant amount of total emissions statewide in 2018. But the future year showed that the contribution from stationary and area-wide sources increases. To attain the 70 PB standard by 2037, additional emission reductions will be necessary from mobile, stationary, and area-wide sources. To achieve this, attainment plans will need emission reduction control strategies from both air districts and the 2022 state SIP strategy. We are keenly aware that emissions from mobile and stationary sources have a disproportionate impact on disadvantaged communities and people of color. For example, many of whom live adjacent to transportation corridors and industrial operations. The potential measures in the 2022 stage ship strategy, especially those covering the freight sector, provide opportunities to significantly reduce emissions and exposure in communities of concern. Staff is currently exploring the best ways to, su to support community level emission reductions as part of the 2022 state SIP strategy. And we know we must do more to provide benefits to the low income and disadvantaged communities who for generations have been bearing the brunt of combustion emissions. In addition to air quality targets and reducing, reducing risk in priority communities, CARB has climate targets, including greenhouse gas reduction goals. CARB developed the 2020 Mobile Source Strategy to look at the goals and potential benefits to all three broad and overlapping groups of pollutants that we're striving to reduce. Criteria pollutants, toxics, and greenhouse gases. This type of planning effort is essential to address the interplay between pollutants, and sources, and consider the benefits of different technologies and energy sources in order to identify the pathways forward that can achieve our many goals. As the 2020 MSS finalizes this fall, CARB will be incorporating the scenario planning and regulatory concepts from the 2020 MSS into the 2022 state SIP strategy, the 2022 scoping plan, and community emission reduction plans under AB 617. Specifically, as it pertains to the SIP required under the Clean Air Act, the program concepts contained in the 2020 MSS will be further developed with ongoing public and stakeholder input and translated into measures and legally enforceable commitments for the 70 PPB standard. To elaborate on this development process a little further, this slide shows the overview of the process for how a concept evolves. Things included in the 2020 MSS and other similarly high-level planning documents start as concepts. And as CARB staff engages with the public and stakeholders, the concepts can be further defined into measures for the 2022 state SIP strategy and regional SIPs. 2022 state SIP strategies and regional SIP measures require more detail and specified timelines in order to establish federally enforceable commitments. As the process continues and program staff at CARB further develop these SIP measures, 
It goes through a formal rulemaking process, including draft rule or program language, staff reports, economic and environmental analyses, and public workshops, working groups, and hearings prior to being adopted by the board as a program to be implemented in California. Implementation dates and timelines are firmly established as part of that development and adoption process, which then define the point at which that regulation will be able to reduce emissions and provide real air quality benefits in communities across the state. Keep in mind, while this process is almost never a straight line and public engagement for a regulation or program is, in many cases, happening simultaneously to the development of the 2022 state shift strategy or other plan, it usually takes anywhere from five to 10 years from start to finish. In support of emerging technologies and to facilitate the regulatory development needed to meet our air quality, toxic, and climate goals, CARB supports advanced technologies across the phases of commercialization. This graphic provides an example of how incentive funding plays a key role for commercializing emerging technologies, thus making the technology feasible for regulatory control. Incentives fund the earlier phases toward advancing emerging technologies during regulatory development to make the technology commercially viable and eventually set as the regulation. Incentives fund the pre-commercial demonstration and pilots for early commercialization phases. Additionally, incentives play a critical role in providing a bridge between early commercial deployment, market scale adoption, and broad purchases incentives. Incentives have and will continue to play a key role in the development of regulations and achieving near-term emission reductions for attainment in the SIP. Before we discuss the 2022 state SIP strategy and potential measures, it is important to review the progress CARB has made since the 2016 state SIP strategy was adopted. As part, of the, as part of the attainment plan for non-attainment areas under the 75 PPB eight hour ozone standard, CARB developed the 2016 state SIP strategy. A few years later, CARB followed up with the San Joaquin Valley supplement to the 2016 state SIP strategy to make additional commitments needed for attainment of particulate matter standards. The 2016 state SIP strategy committed to emission reduction measures to support non-attainment areas in meeting the 75 PPB standard by the respective attainment years. The 2022 state shift strategy will build on the emission reductions from the 2016 strategy in order to further improve air quality across California. The following slides will show how CARB has adopted or is pursuing adoption of control measures committed to in committed to in the 2016 state SIP strategy. The following chart shows the list of measures CARB committed to in the 2016 strategy, their adoption and implementation dates. These control measures are critical to the successful improvement of air quality in California and meeting the 75 PPB standard by the attainment year. Many of the measures in the 2016 strategy focused on on-road mobile sources, such as advanced clean trucks regulation, which has a manufacturer zero emission truck sales and reporting requirement, and the heavy duty omnibus regulation reduces the exhaust emission standards, test procedures, and other, emission related, other emissions related requirements for 2024 and subsequent model year California certified heavy duty engines. Off-road measures were also included, such as the ocean-going vessel at birth regulation, which places requirements on the emissions from auxiliary engines on ocean-going vessels docked at California ports. The 
There are only a few remaining measures left that need to be adopted. These measures are scheduled for latest, for latest adoption by the end of next year. For on-road, the heavy duty inspection and maintenance prep program will ensure heavy duty vehicles operating in California have properly functioning control systems and that emissions related malfunctions are repaired in a timely manner. And the Advanced Clean Cars 2 regulation will seek to reduce criteria and greenhouse gas emissions from new light and medium duty vehicles beyond the 2025 model year. And increase the number of zero emission vehicles for sale. For off-road measures, the 2016 States of Strategy pursued, pursued the emerging transition of off-road mobile sources towards zero emissions. We are now going to take our first break in the presentation to hear some of your questions and comments. We are going to limit this to 10 minutes here, and then we'll take all the remaining questions and comments at the end of the presentation. On Zoom, please use the Q&A box for this first break. We will try to take questions in the order received. Verbal questions using the raised hand function will be reserved for the end of the presentation. One second. We're trying to get organized on the questions. Just bear with us. Sorry, one second, I need to open the Q&A. My apologies. Okay, uh, the first one. In the notice of preparation under probable environmental effects, it notes that potential adverse impacts, such as the construction of new facilities, would be associated with the reasonably foreseeable compliance responses related to the strategy, Will any construction or modification of existing facilities that CARB itself must undertake for compliance with this strategy be covered under this environmental analysis, or would that be covered under separate environmental documents? Thanks, Austin. I'll take that question. Um, we just want to clarify that um, construction, while it is noted on the NOP and it is a possible environmental effect of the 2022 state SIF strategy, um, but strategy is not proposing any new construction as a part of the project itself. So any construction that would be permitted or reviewed under CEQA, um, that would happen at the later date by the lead agency with jurisdiction over that construction. Thanks, Ariel. Um, so the second question um, from Michael Murphy, thank you for the clear information showed on slide 12, but where does responsibility for VMT reductions and other mode ship efforts that reduce emissions fall within the federal, state, local spectrum? Thank you, Austin. This is Sylvia. Um, I'll go ahead and answer that question. Um, as you know, we do have a state requirement of SB 375 that requires the reduction of VMT throughout the state and the local agencies involved, the MPOs, have uh, adopted programs and such um, to reduce VMT across the state. As far as um, how those emissions and what category they fall in, they are definitely local emissions and we definitely will strive to um, reduce emissions you know, any, anywhere possible. And we are looking at how to incorporate um, VMT reductions um, possibly in the states of strategy. Okay. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, I just wanted to remind people too that um, as we try to respond to everyone's questions, uh, if you could please try to use the uh, Q&A box instead of the chat box. Um, we just wanna make sure that we get everyone's uh, questions answered. Um, so if you could do that, I, we appreciate it. 
Um, so the next question I have is, will you support conversions from diesel to full battery electric vehicle for heavy duty trucks? Um, hello, this is Sam Pornozeri. So um, as, as described in the mobile source strategy, I mean, what we're seeing uh, for the transportation sector, um, the technology mix is needed for transportation sector to meet our longer term air quality, uh, climate goals, as well as, I mean, um, reducing toxic exposures in communities. We need, really need to move towards zero emission technologies. So, uh, and, and that zero emission technology could include battery electric vehicles or fuel cell electric vehicles uh, in, the, in the heavy duty and light duty space, as well as the off-road. Uh, on top of that, last September, Governor Newsom signed an executive order uh, which requires uh, California agencies, especially CARB, to establish regulations and measures and strategies uh, to move the transportation sector towards zero emission, specifically by 2035, all new light duty vehicles need to be zero emissions and all drayage trucks needs to be zero emissions when by 2045, the rest of the heavy duty fleet should be zero emissions. So because of those reasons, we are definitely supportive of moving towards zero emission technology for the transportation sector, um, for, for both light and heavy duty vehicles, as well as the off-road uh, equipment um, in the transportation sector. Thanks, Sam. Um, next question. Can you include expected technologies in your design of regulations or equipment they will gradually replace? Uh, maybe I can answer that question. So, I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, we have done some scenario analysis as, as was presented in the 2020 mobile source strategy, uh, which you can find a revised draft version of it on CARB's website. And it really shows, I mean, uh, the analysis that we have done to look at the mixes of technology in each of the sectors of the transportation and general mobile sources that needs to evolve for us to meet our collective goals. So I can definitely, um, we can definitely point you to that document and it does show those technology mixes and the state SIP strategy is going to really define how are we gonna go, how are we going to achieve those technology mixes in different sectors and what sort of measure and strategies needs to be implemented in order to reach those mixes. Thanks, Sam. I think we're gonna take one more question. Um, let's see, uh, it says tribal nations. How does the 2022 state SIP strategy affect tribal nations? Uh, suggest update the map on slide six titled 70 PPB eight hour ozone standard to show tribal nations. I think Sylvia. Yeah, hi, this is Sylvia Vanderspeck. You know, thank you very much for your, your comment, you know, as, um, you know, there are a number of tribal nations that are across the state and located in these um, non-attainment areas that the state has responsibility for developing the state implementation plans for. Um, and all of the emission reductions that we plan on implementing that will have um, provide for improved air quality will be statewide measures and will have benefits in these tribal nations also. Thank you, Sylvia. And that was, I was, I failed to, I was supposed to say people's names. So I apologize for that. But that was from um, uh, Shirley Rivera. And the previous uh, question was from, well, I'll do that. Anyway, I think we're going to move on. Um, so I think uh, we're going to save the rest of the questions for the end. Um, and we're going to continue through the presentation. Let me get back. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you all for those questions. We are now going to move forward to discuss our ideas.
or potential new measures that CARB staff is looking at to include in the 2022 state SIP strategy. As we are at the beginning of the process, we are looking for your input in response to what we have at this stage, as well as your ideas for additional measures that CARB should explore. This is just a preliminary list, and we expect that as we work with the air districts to flesh out the full emission reductions needed from state sources and identify carrying capacities, this list will evolve and grow to meet the need. There is also still a lot to be defined for many of the potential measures we are presenting here today. So please feel free to provide feedback and suggestions related to the items listed in the next few slides. Diving right in, the first slide here shows our preliminary list of measures to further reduce emissions from on-road mobile sources. As you just heard through those slides before the break, our 2016 state SIP strategy and its San Joaquin Valley supplement included commitment, commitments to adopt very significant programs to reduce on-road emissions, including Advanced Clean Cars 2, Heavy Duty Omnibus, and Heavy Duty Inspection and Maintenance programs. Going forward, CARB will build on the heavy duty programs with complementary efforts and expand our efforts to electrify the on-road light duty fleet through the clean miles standard regulation and new emission standards from on-road motorcycles. The first item shown here on the slide is CARB's recently adopted clean mile standard program to reduce emissions from ride hailing companies like Uber and Lyft. The new regulation includes two annual targets, an electric vehicle miles traveled or EVMT target, as well as a greenhouse gas target per passenger mile traveled. The EVMT target will require regulated entities to achieve 90% electric vehicle mile traveled by 2030. While this was adopted by the board in May of this year, the clean mile standard was not included in our previous state SIP strategies, and thus it will be included and accounted for as part of the 2022 strategy. The Advanced Clean Fleets Regulation is CARB's program in development to implement zero emission fleet requirements for heavy duty trucks. Complementary to the Advanced Clean, clean Trucks Regulation adopted last year. This effort is part of our comprehensive strategy to achieve a zero emission vehicle truck and bus fleet by 2045, everywhere feasible and significantly earlier for certain well-suited market segments, such as last mile delivery, drayage, and government fleets. The current thinking for the ACF measure would be to phase in purchase requirements for public fleets, fleets phase in registration requirements for drayage trucks, and phase in zero emission vehicle fleet percentage requirements for high priority private and federal fleets, with implementation beginning in the 2023 timeframe. The next item on the slide here, phase three of greenhouse gas emission standards for medium and heavy duty vehicles, would build upon previous phase two requirements and look to achieve additional emission reductions through the introduction of the next generation of integrated engine, powertrain, vehicle, and trailer technologies designed to reduce climate emissions and fuel use. CARB staff would work closely with US EPA staff to develop new national GHG emission standards to achieve greater emission reductions from future medium and heavy duty engines. While this preliminary measure primarily targets reductions in GHG emissions, there will also be reductions in NOx and ROG that will be accounted for in the SIP. Finally, CARB is also looking at new emission standards for on-road motorcycles. The primary goal of this potential measure would be to reduce emissions from new motorcycles by adopting more stringent exhaust, and evaporative emission standards, along with zero emission sales thresholds. 
In 2020, on-road motorcycles accounted for 9.3% of all California mobile ROG emissions, as well as a smaller percent of NOx and other pollutants. CARB would look to develop new exhaust emission standards for NOx, carbon monoxide, and hydrocarbons, a subset of ROG, to better harmonize with more aggressive current European motorcycle emission standards. Staff would also develop new evaporative emission standards that, are, that largely harmonize with more aggressive current CARB off-highway recreational vehicle emission standards. Pivoting now to the off-road sector, our preliminary list of potential measures to control emissions from off-road vehicles and equipment includes a broad range of programs that go far beyond those in previous SIP strategies. Emissions from off-road vehicles and equipment are significant and contribute about 35% of total statewide NOx emissions in 2017, with that contribution expected to continue to grow into the future. The first item on the slide here is amendments to the in-use off-road diesel fueled fleets regulation. The in-use off-road equipment sector includes equipment used in industries such as construction, mining, industrial, oil drilling, and similar industries and covers mobile diesel vehicles 25 horsepower or greater. This potential measure would inv involve amendments to the existing program that would create additional requirements to the current regulated fleets by targeting the oldest and dirtiest equipment that is allowed to operate indefinitely under the current regulation structure. Tier five off-road engine standards would target reductions from off-road engines in a different way by setting more stringent emission standards for new engines for all power categories. NOx emissions from land-based off-road compression ignition engines are currently the second largest category of mobile source emissions subject to CARB regulation. The NOx emissions from this category are projected to make up 24% of the mobile source diesel emissions inventory and 34% of the particulate matter inventory in 2030. The standards that CARB is considering for this measure would be more stringent than required by current US EPA and European stage five non-road regulations and require the use of best available control technologies for both particulate matter and NOx. The next item on the slide here is the off-road zero emission targeted manufacturer rule. Existing zero emission regulations and regulations currently under development target a variety of sectors, including forklifts and cargo handling equipment. However, as technology advancements occur, there are certain sectors that CARB staff believe could accelerate through a targeted manufacturer zero emission regulation. The potential regulation would require manufacturers of off-road equipment and or engines to produce for sale zero emissions equipment or powertrains as a percentage of their annual statewide sales volume. Commercial harbor craft in California include fishing vessels, ferries, excursion vessels, tugboats, towboats, crew and supply boats, barges, dredges, and other vessel types. CARB staff is currently undergoing a public process looking to amend the current commercial harbor craft regulation. The potential amendments require zero emission short run less than three nautical miles for ferries and zero emission compatible for new excursion vessels. Also, the amendments would establish in-use performance standards to tier three or tier four plus diesel particulate filter for most other in-use and new vessels and tier two minimum requirements on commercial fishing, fishing vessels. Finally, the amendments require new reporting, record keeping, fuel, oh, fuel, opacity testing, and compliance fees. CARB is also considering new requirements to transition diesel powered transport refrigeration units, or TRU, to zero emission technology in two phases. Part, part one, which was included in the 2016 SafeSip strategy, is looking to amend the existing TRU 
airborne toxic control measure to require the transition of diesel power truck TRUs to zero emissions. A diesel particulate matter emission standard for newly manufactured TRUs in the remaining categories and lowering global warming potential refrigerant. As part of the 2022 stage of strategy, CARB is considering a measure for, for the potential part two regulation to require zero emission trailer TRUs, domestic shipping container TRUs, rail car TRUs, TRU generation, generator sets, and direct drive refrigeration units. Continuing with the potential measures for the off-road sector, cargo handling equipment includes things like yard tractors, rubber tired gantry cranes, container handlers, forklifts, and can be a significant source of emissions in communities near ports and intermodal rail facilities. CARB adopted the current cargo handling equipment regulation in 2005, and it was fully implemented by the end of 2017. CARB staff are currently assessing potential amendments to the mobile cargo, mobile cargo handling equipment regulation and researching the availability and performance of zero emission hybrid technologies to reduce emissions from a fleet predominantly powered by internal combustion engines. The next item is the Clean Off-Road Fleets Recognition Program. All self-propelled off-road diesel vehicles, 25 horsepower or greater used in California and most two engine vehicles, which are subject to the off-road diesel regulation. The off-road diesel regulation achieves reductions by requiring fleet owners to, to meet declining fleet average emission targets by replacing or repowering old engines or installing exhaust retrofits. The Clean Off-Road Fleet Recognition Program would establish a framework that would encourage fleets to incorporate advanced technology and zero emission vehicles into their fleets prior to or above and beyond regulatory mandates. Finally, the Clean Off-Road Equipment Voucher Incentive Project, or CORE, established a first come first served voucher program for off-road equipment that began, funding, that began funding in 2020. The project targets commercialized products that have yet to achieve a significant market foothold. It is designed to accelerate deployment of cleaner technologies by providing a streamlined process for fleets ready to purchase specific zero emission equipment to receive funding to offset the higher cost of such technologies. The Clean Off-Road Equipment Voucher Construction, or CORE, CON would expand CORE to include certain equipment types used in construction, mining, agriculture that appear primed for zero emission technology growth, given the equipment power demand and duty cycle, as well as availability of product offerings. Consistent with CORE goals, CORE CON would continue to promote the deployment of, of zero emission technology in the off-road sector. Along with on-road sources and off-road equipment, CARB staff is, is reviewing potential SIP measures from other sources, such as spark ignition marine engines and consumer products. For potential spark ignition marine engine standards, CARB staff is looking to reduce emissions from new marine, new marine engines by adopting more stringent exhaust standards for types of watercraft that currently do not use catalyst control technologies. Staff is also evaluating whether a percentage of outboard and personal watercraft vessels could be propelled by zero emission technologies in certain applications. While many of the on-road and off-road mobile source measures mentioned above are focused on reducing NOx emissions, reductions from, other precursor from the other precursor pollutant are also critical to the attainment of federal standards in some areas, especially in the near term. For that reason, CARB staff is looking to amend the current consumer products regulation to achieve reductions in volatile organic compounds. The previous slide shows CARB is pursuing a significant number of measures to achieve emission reductions necessary to attain the 70 PPB standard. But it is important to mention that some mobile sources are primarily regulated at the federal 
and international level. Even so, CARB will pursue measures for, from locomotives, aviation, ocean-going vessels to the extent available under our authority. For locomotives, CARB is currently looking at developing an in-use locomotive regulation to accelerate the adoption of advanced, cleaner technologies for locomotive operations. The in-use locomotive regulation includes a pathway to accelerate the immediate adoption of advanced, cleaner technologies for all locomotive operations. It would be implemented statewide and provide an opportunity for railroads to better address regional pollution and long-standing environment, environmental justice concerns with communities near rail yards. Future measures for aviations are being explored in order to reduce emissions from airport and aircraft related activities. Due to US EPA's authority on setting emission standards, CARB would strongly advocate for stricter, stricter emission reductions and highlight the need to reduce pollution to protect public health. Emission reductions can also be achieved by pursuing incentives for aviation operations. CARB would similarly work with US EPA, air districts, airports, and industry stakeholders in a collaborative effort to develop regulations, voluntary measures, and incentive programs. California has two primary regulations currently in place to reduce emissions from ocean-going vessels. The first, the Vessel Clean Fuel Regulation, which was adopted in 2008 and requires all OGVs to use cleaner 0.1% sulfur distillate grade fuels while in regulated California waters. And the second, the at birth regulation, which requires regulated vessels to connect to shore power or use an alternative emissions control technology to reduce emissions while docked at birth at regulated California seaports. In 2020, CARB expanded the 2007 version of the at birth regulation by extending emission control requirements. CARB is evaluating further regulatory actions to achieve additional emission reductions from ocean going vessels through the use of operational changes and new technologies currently in development, including advances in exhaust capture and control, mobile shore power connections, cleaner fuels, alternative power sources, as well as positive vessel side technologies. While CARB and the district are working to identify all actions within our jurisdictions to reduce emissions from primarily federally regulated sources, I want to highlight that we cannot achieve the reductions needed without action at the federal level. As can be seen on this plot, mobile source NOx emissions in the South Coast from sources under state control have decreased 75% since 2000 and are projected to continue decreasing as we implement the programs CARB has on the books and adopt additional mobile source regulations. Without new emission standards at the federal level, the emissions from primarily federally regulated sources are expected to decline only slightly over the next decade, such that they surpass emissions from California regulated mobile sources before 2030. That being said, we have a more positive outlook for addressing emissions from federally regulated sources in the coming years, and will continue to collaborate with US EPA and other agencies to support bold actions at the federal level to implement new emission standards and other controls that can drastically cut emissions from interstate trucks, planes, trains, and ocean going vessels. Complementary to state controls, continued action by the local air district to control stationary and other sources under their authority is also imperative to attain. The pie chart on this slide shows statewide NOx emissions in 2037, the 70 PPB extreme area not attainment year. According to CARB's baseline emissions inventory, as previously mentioned, our baseline inventories reflect adopted control programs, including the advanced clean truck and heavy duty omnibus regulations. 
While mobile sources contribute around 80% of the NOx emissions statewide today, CARB's control programs will drive significant reductions across all mobile so sectors, such that sources controlled primarily by the air districts become a relatively larger portion of the overall emissions in the, in the future. Many districts are already working diligently to identify additional controls they can undertake to reduce emissions from these sources and support attainment of the 70 PPB standard in their regions and are also engaging in thorough public process at the district level. As we move through this attainment planning process over the next year, it is important that we remember that the responsibility for reducing emissions to meet federal standards are shared across all levels of government local, state, and federal. As previously mentioned, the SIP at CARB is, the SIP team at CARB is also working to identify ways that the 2022 state SIP strategy can support community level emission reductions. We know that many of the potential measures I talked about here today can provide significant air quality benefits in priority communities, but we are also looking into how we can go even further to incorporate the needs and wants of community members into this plan. We will be working with the Office of Community Air Protection and CARB's environmental justice team internally to better understand the results of all of the effort the community members and representatives have already put into the AB 617, and other car planning processes. Beyond that though, we are hoping to hear directly from community members and representatives on the webinar today and going forward with your thoughts and input as to how we can do more for priority communities with the 2022 state SIP strategy. As part of the 2022 state SIP strategy, CARB is developing an economic analysis. CARB staff will develop an economic analysis that includes statewide costs and cost savings from the 2022 state SIP strategy measures. CARB staff uses the Regional Economic Models Incorporated, REMI, to assess the economic impact to the California economy through the 2037 attainment year. The economic analysis will be included as an appendix to the 2022 state SIP strategy. Also part of the 22 state SIP strategy, CARB is developing an environmental analysis as required as under the California Environmental Quality Act. CARB is preparing a programmatic level environmental analysis assessing the potential for adverse and beneficial environmental impacts associated with the 2022 state SIP strategy. The EA is prepared according to the requirements of our certified regulatory program under the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. The EA will be based on the anticipated reasonably foreseeable actions undertaken by ent entities in response to the plan, which could have the potential to cause indirect physical changes to the environment. CARB is using the CEQA environmental checklist Appendix G from the CEQA guidelines as a framework for assessing the potential for significant impacts res resulting from reasonably foreseeable actions. The checklist includes criteria related to resource areas such as aesthetics, agricultural and forest resources, biological resources, cultural resources, geologic and soil resources, hazard and hazardous materials, among others. The EA will be included as an appendix to the 2022 state SIP strategy. The EA will include a description of the reasonably foreseeable actions that appear most likely to occur as a result of implementing the plan, the potential adverse impacts and feasible mitigation measures, and alternatives analysis. Staff welcomes public input on the appropriate scope and content of the EA as it's being developed, including the reasonably foreseeable actions that may occur in response to the proposal, the potential significant adverse impacts, potential feasible mitigation measures, and feasible alternatives to the proposal that could reduce or eliminate any significant adverse impacts. 
The draft EA will be released for a 45 day public comment period with the 2022 state SIP strategy. Before we get back to questions, I'm going to wrap things up by discussing how we will move forward. For the 2022 state SIF strategy, the next steps are outlined on this slide. We're planning to have our second workshop working group in the fall. After that, CARB staff will release a draft 2022 state SIF strategy and present to our board an informational update in late 2021, early 2022. CARB will host a third workshop working group with additional details about the measures in winter spring of 2022. Finally, CARB will release a finalized version of the proposed 2022 state ship strategy in the spring of 2022 in advance of a summer 2022 board hearing. If you have any questions after today's webinar, please feel free to reach out to myself, Austin Hicks, or Ariel Fiddledye, or for general questions, um, email at SIP planning at arb.ca.gov. We also have the website shown on the slide here, which we'll, we'll be using to post up, which we'll be using to post updated information. All right, one more time. On Zoom, please either use the raise hand feature or type into the Q&A box. On the phone, please use number two to raise your hand. Note that number two may be different than what you're used to for Zoom webinars. We will try to take questions in the order received and balance between verbal ones and those being typed in the questions box. If using the raised hand feature on Zoom or the phone, please leave your hand up and we will call on you and allow you to speak. Then you will be able to, then you will be able to unmute yourself to begin. Um, so I'm going to go to the Q&A and let's see. So Mark, I, Sam, I think this was in response to a previous question, but he said conversions of the existing trucks. So I think he was elaborating on his previous question, maybe. Yeah. Sure. Um, and 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 there will be another question. We will uh, we will further elaborate on this. Um, okay. But uh, with respect to the governor's executive order, um, that include both new and in-use trucks. So um, governor's executive order requires all drayage trucks, um, regardless whether they're new or they have been in use to be zero emission by 2035 and the rest of the fleet were feasible um, to be zero emission by 2045. So it does include um, existing as well as uh, new trucks. Austin, I think you're on mute. Thanks, thanks, Sam. <laughs> I took a drink and I didn't want to disturb you. Thank you. Um, so the next question I believe is from Chris, and I I apologize for names. Um, uh, Chav Chavaria, um, how does this affect small gas engines that are used on mobile pressure washer manufactured for use in California? Sam, that looks like you again. Sure. So. Um... As described, and it has, has been workshop um, by CARB several times, CARB is, uh, is, is, is looking, I mean, is, is pursuing a regulatory action on small off-road engines. These are the uh, mostly gasoline engines, less than 25 horsepower, which are used in lawn and garden application, as well as some of the light commercial application, including pressure washer that requires them to move to zero emission uh, as soon as possible. I mean, there are proposals that are going to be considered by a board later this year, uh, which requires, I mean, starting either 24 or 25 timeframe um, that most of these engines to be zero emissions um, for, for sales in California. So um, the, the small off-road engine um, measure that is in the SIP uh, is, is going to um, significantly reduce uh, both NOx as well as our reactive organic gases known as ROG emissions in California. Thanks, Sam. 
So another, uh, so Mark, Mark Ro Roast, um, we're doing new technology that will disrupt present technology. So I'd like to work with you on how. I'm sure we're definitely interested, Mark, um, to to learn about your um, to learn about the technology you're presenting. Uh, I can see there are a couple of other um, uh, notes that you made. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. I mean, on the email addresses that Austin provided, um, and we can definitely contact you and learn more about this technology you're talking about. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Thanks, Sam. Okay, next, uh, Todd Campbell. Um, do you think it's okay to totally miss the 2023 Clean Air Act deadline for the South Coast? And is your failure to your and is your failure to aggressively pursue a near-term emission strategy a winning strategy? Do you think EPA will give you a pass because you're acting like near-term public health goals are less important than long-term gamble that you are pursuing with ZEVs? zero emission vehicles. The light duty ZEV program was implemented in 1990 and we are still in the single dig dig digits for penetration. Why, what, why must we repeat history? Austin, I'll go ahead and answer that question. Um, thank you very much for your question. Improving air quality in the South Coast is very important to CARB, but right now we see that there are no feasible new measures that we can be, that can be implemented within the 2023 timeframe. So in the near term, CARB is maximizing um, the amount of emission reductions we are, we can achieve from the programs that are already in development and coming to the board in the next year. The strategy that we're working with very closely with South Coast will be for the um, meeting the 70 PPP standard in 2037. And to reach that goal, we will also be meeting the 75 and the 80 PPP standard along the way. I do wanna add one more thing is that, you know, right now we are definitely considering all feasible measures as we're moving forward and developing the state strategy. I'll mute myself again, sorry. Um, let's see, I have another question from uh, Michael Lewis. It appears you have a ROG problem, in part because you have pursued a NOx only strategy for the last 20 years. All the programs you are proposing address NOx, not ROG. What are you going to do about the cold, the old cars that, pr that produce most of the ROG? Electric vehicle strategies won't get those old vehicles. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mike, for for asking that question. Um, although, like, although the, um, the as you as you mentioned, uh, most of the measures um, um, listed in in this strategy or in the previous strategy were really trying to achieve significant NOx reductions. However, uh, there are a lot of measures that CARB has been putting in place that are going to achieve significant ROG reductions. I mean, of those, I can definitely mention a few, but there are, the list is definitely longer than that, including the small off-road engines, which target, as I mentioned, target um, smaller, I mean, less than 25 horsepower uh, gasoline engines, which majority of their emissions is, um, is VOC or ROG emissions. Um, I want to also point to their consumer product regulations, which tries to, I mean, tackle the VOC emissions uh, from, uh, from our consumer products. And, uh, and on top of those, I mean, we had a longstanding smog check program for a long time that has been trying to control emissions from light duty vehicles and in both, both their evaporative emissions as well as their exhaust emission to make sure those emissions are within the acceptable levels. And through the standards for our light duty vehicles, from level one all the way to level three. And um, in future with the ACC2, we're trying to tackle those, I mean, ROG emissions and try to reduce and maximize the emission reductions in our, in our VOC space. 
Um, I also, I mean, you also mentioned about how about the old cars? I mean, that's definitely a very, very important category. I mean, we, we understand there are still a lot of older cars, I mean, operating on California roadways and they, they do have significantly higher emissions than new vehicles. CARB has some programs, I mean, for example, to name one, Clean Cars for All, which, I mean, which requires, which pretty much pay for the or provide incentive funding um, to, to vehicles, to older vehicles, especially in disadvantaged communities, um, to be scrapped and be replaced with zero emission vehicles. And there has been program in the past, such as EFMP or FMP plus programs, which um, has been administered by our Bureau of Automotive Repairs to accelerate that scrappage of the older vehicles and replacing them with either new vehicles or, or zero emission and plug-in electric vehicles. So there are those kind of programs uh, in place that are specifically, I mean, tackling uh, not only NOx emissions, but also NOx and VOC emissions to make sure that while we're reducing our NOx emissions, you're also making uh, progress in, in significant reductions in our VOC. Thanks, Sam. Um, so we're gonna take one more written question then we're gonna switch to the raised hands. But the last written question is, um, I believe this is from Bill McGavern from Coalition Clean Air. Uh, do you have a retirement strategy for old diesel post 2010 trucks? Sam, I think you're up again. Sure. Um, yes, there are. I mean, uh, Bill, as, as, as you're, you're well aware, aware, I mean, there is a CARB is working on a regulation called Vance Clean Fleet Rule. Uh, which basically requires, I mean, fleets um, such as drayage trucks or, I mean, or priority fleets, fleets that have more than a certain number of trucks or more than a certain amount of revenue to uh, get rid of their older or get rid of their trucks and replace those with, um, with, with zero emission trucks. Um, through that program, we're expecting to see some scrappage of older trucks, especially in the drayage business, where we're expecting that starting 2023, 2024 timeframe, those older diesels will be replaced with, with zero emission. At the same time, our incentive programs like Carl Moyer program is designed really to accelerate the um, a scrappage of the um, of older diesel and post 2010 diesel equipment in the future. Once the truck and bus rule is fully implemented, then the whole fleet going to be 2010 and newer, and and these programs um, will 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 continue to to accelerate those older equipments and um, accelerate the scrappage of those older equipments. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so I'm gonna to switch to the raised hands. Um, the first raised hand I have is from Bill. Um, I, before I switch over, um, just so everyone knows that we're gonna uh, allow, we're gonna set a two minute time limit for each raised hand. Um, so uh, you'll have two minutes and then uh, we'll mute you so that we can make sure we can address um, everybody's raised hands and give them an opportunity to talk. So um, Bill, I'm gonna let, allow you to talk first. Thanks very much. This is Bill McGavern with the Coalition for Clean Air. And uh, we're really facing an enormous challenge here as I think you know the CARB staff are well aware. We're uh, well away from attainment and have to throw basically everything we have at this problem. So uh, you know we, we support all of the measures that have been outlined here. And some of them, of course, have been in the works for a while and, and are not surprising at all. Others I haven't heard of before. And so I'm glad to see you're addressing areas like on-road motorcycles, which have not been addressed. Some of the uh, marine engines and other off-road engines that are highly polluting and really do need further regulation. Uh, I also think that you do have uh, more feasible measures and particularly that you should have more of a strategy for accelerated retirement of diesel trucks, the 2010 and newer ones that are, are getting older. Uh, and when they reach the end of their useful lives, they should be retired. Incentives alone will not be enough to accomplish that. So uh, in the advanced clean fleets rule, 
there should be a requirement that when those trucks reach the end of their useful lives, which is defined in statute, um, that they should have to be retired. Similar to what's being proposed for drayage trucks, that should be the case for all trucks. Thanks very much for uh, hearing my comments. You're on mute, Austin. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, Brian, I am now going to allow you to talk. Take two minutes. Brian, can you unmute yourself? Um, Okay, I'm going to move on from Brian. Um, the next one is a phone number uh, starting in nine uh, nine four nine five three six one nine six two. I'm unmuting you. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, is that you, Brian? Yes, it is. This is. Oh, Brian. I'm. Okay, uh, one sec. One second. Um, you go ahead, Brian. This is Brian Kolochi with Kolochi Corp. Uh, my question is: Is would CARB consider oxy combustion technologies uh, such as uh, oxygen production from membranes in combustion systems to reduce NOx and CO concentrations from emissions, as uh, verified by the United States Department of Energy? Um, it, the reason I promote uh, the oxy combustion technology, it also reduces fuel gas consumption by up to 50%. For, uh, and, and it's a good transition technology for the non-renewable fire power plants, um, allowing them to phase out and other technologies to phase in. Thank you for allowing me to ask my question. Sorry for the delay in unmuting. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. I think Sam's going to answer the question. Yeah, sorry. I think I, there was also bills as well. I'm sorry, Sam. Uh, no worries. No worries. Uh, definitely, we can we can take a look at those. Um, I mean, Brian, we can take a look at the technology. If you can contact us, I mean, again, through email, um, we can have an offline conversation on that. Uh, we're interested to hear more about that. Uh, regarding uh, Bill McGavern, I mean, comment on the hmm. scrappage, I mean, um, that is definitely something that uh, we're looking at at Bill. Um, we're looking at, um, I mean, how we can um, accelerate scrappage, as you mentioned, incentive programs, I mean, can work to some extent and, and regulatory actions to accelerate scrappage is definitely, I mean, uh, can play a bigger role. I mean, um, having useful life limits and, and other things, we're definitely considering some of those options as we are developing the advanced clean fleet rules. Thanks, Sam. Um, okay, um, sorry, 949-536-1962. Um, I am now going to unmute you. Hi, Thank can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, this is Ryan Kenny with Clean Energy. Thank you for taking uh, my call and uh, thanks for the presentation today. I did wanna just make some uh, comments following up on what Todd Campbell mentioned and, and Bill McGavin, that Bill's comments were, were excellent. Uh, on slide 21, you've got adopted measures. Slide 22, you have measures still in development. And I noticed on the bus has an implementation date of 2024, but I just wanna make sure that we're clear that 0.02 NOx doesn't go into effect until 2027. And I know one of the staff members uh, replied to Todd's comment that uh, you know it's getting kind of late for 2023 implementation. But I, will, I wanna add that you know stakeholders have for years been complaining about not enough has been, has been uh, not enough attention has been given towards 2023 and 2024 in the San Joaquin Valley, and here we are. 
and now you know carbs response as well it's too late we gotta move on but that's not the case over the last you know five six seven years it's been quite a while as stakeholders have expressed that view uh that being said you know we want to see at least some incremental progress towards 2023 and 2024 and we got to look at 2031 and you know on the bus regulation that, that doesn't go into effect at, at 0.02 until 2027 is really too late um i also want to add that you know you have some analyses in the in the slide deck which is great but i don't see anything in there regarding the commercial readiness of heavy duty zeb if you talk to manufacturers in the oem they're not going to be commercially ready to displace diesel on a one-for-one -one basis for five to ten years so we'd really like for, for carb to include an analysis because the largest source of NOx is from diesel trucks and as bill mentioned we've got to get those off the off the road immediately so uh, just a few comments uh, for your consideration thank you thank you ryan hi ryan thank you so much for your comment you know as you know the state SIP strategy, we're, we're right now, we're at the um, beginning of developing this. We are looking at all opportunities to reduce emissions. Um, you know, there's, you know, as you know, there's money out there for incentives and things like that. And we definitely want to make sure that, you know, we take all suggestions as we're moving forward here. Okay. Hello, this is Mark Roost with yep. Sustainable Energy Inc. in San Mateo, California. Thank you. So uh, I think the key issue here is that the rationale for not converting old trucks to full battery electric has been based on the high price and the inability to go 500 to 600 miles with a full payload on class eight trucks. We'll solve that problem with high capacity batteries that we expect to be able to sell at less than $100 a kilowatt hour. And there is also a company that makes and sells conversion kits that needs financial support to become a presence in the market. We need financial support to get to the market to commercialize in the first place because we're just now getting ready. We're just now basically building a testable battery. Uh, so we think that with the right support, we can actually open a factory by September of 2022 that has the capacity to convert the 8,000 or more trucks with these, you know, drainage trucks, uh, class eight trucks with uh, 2009 and earlier engine model year things. Um, for the 2010 and later, um, we're focused first on those because they're going to be precluded from going into the ports, according to what CARB has been saying. Um, hopefully you'll keep that rule. And uh, hopefully the uh, short range trucks will be uh, helped with the conversion kits using lithium batteries. So we're doing non-lithium batteries that'll have several times the range of the conversion battery at, the same, at a lower cost per uh, kilowatt hour. And so that should open the door to that plus the solar thin film we're going to be making at twice the capa twice the efficiency of the best solar panels commercially available today should solve the problem of both charging and uh, traction batteries uh, for getting the truck fleet converted and getting rid of the smog in the San Joaquin Valley and in the Los Angeles you know, the San Pedro Bay smog and the, the uh, Oakland, Port of Oakland and the West Oakland uh, impacts, all of that can be handled. And we believe that with the right support, with the right speed, our cost of factories and our cost, our 15 seconds, Mark, to be low enough that by 2030, we can actually completely eliminate fossil fuels in the world. And that that's a it's an exponential growth function of adding factories year by year and the factories doing 150 or more gigawatt hours of wrap, wrap it up mark thank you thank you okay and teresa Bowie from pacific environment yes hi thank you so hi. much Hi, my name is Teresa Bui. I'm the State Climate Policy Director at Pacific Environment. Thanks for the great presentation today. 
Um, it was pretty shocking to see that by 2037, the statewide NOx emission for OGB is going to be 27% of the state's um, emission. Just was wondering if you can talk more about how you are prioritizing OGV emissions. Um, you mentioned a few um, efforts that you're working on. Thank you. Um, I can speak to, to the OGV. Um, Theresa, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, OGV is one of, uh, one of the few sectors that instead of the emissions going down, we're actually seeing a growth in the emissions. Part of that is, um, is definitely I mean, lack of actions that we're seeing either federal or international level by IMO. Um, and, um, and we're definitely looking into, into the actions that we can take as, 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 as a state agency as, as California uh, in order to reduce emissions. We are working with, I mean, South Coast districts um, as well as, I mean, other districts in order to see what sort of, I mean, strategies can be taken at the local level. I mean, through the indirect source rules or any other strategies like incentive programs that can be taken to reduce emissions from OGVs. And at the same time, making sure we're working with our federal counterparts to advocate at IMO to make sure that the future engines uh, for, um, for OGVs are, are much cleaner in terms of NOx as well as the PM and, and see the possibility that if there are possibility for any sort of like NOx standards or in-use NOx standards for OGVs to make sure that, I mean, South Coast region which has, I mean, very severe air pollution uh, can meet its attainment in 2031, 2037. Thanks, Sam. Um, I have, uh, Mark provided three more comments. Oh, I'm sorry. So I, I don't see any more hands raised. Um, so I'm gonna move back to the Q and A. Um, so I'm gonna pick up where we left off. Uh, Mark has three comments. Uh, I was gonna read um, all three comments. Uh, we'll provide low cost stationary batteries and low cost solar thin film that may reach 48% efficiency, twice today's best commercial solar panels. And from our network, the structural geometries and materials that will make rugged solar canopies to harvest the sun and store in the stationary batteries. We hope to commercialize batteries by September 2022 in the time to convert the trucks in generally good condition from 2009 and earlier engine model year drayage trucks by December 31st, 2022, and the solar thin film and structural supports for solar canopies by charging uh, for charging by 2023. The next step is to work with the makers of the trailers to print out thin film solar P PV 50 microns thick on the sheets that they will use as the skins of their products, top, both ends, and both sides, turning them into substantial solar generators on their own interesting integrated manufacturing problems. Delivered that electricity to the truck as it is made on the road or in the parking space and voila, you have a major range extender. How major? 1000 watts per meter squared at sea level, higher at, alti uh, higher at high altitudes, times 48% times six hours per day equals 2,880 watts hours per day. And then the thin film will work well in uh, scattered, reflected, or diffused light by design. Now that, not that it harvests light that is filtered out, but that it works efficiently with the light that it gets through. Thanks, Mark. We appreciate your comments. I am going to move on to Steve Ben Bolton. For public transparency and faith in ZEV efforts, will there be clear data and summaries as to where the power electricity for these vehicles comes from and what the true trade-off is between emissions from energy production versus emissions from internal combustion vehicles? Also, is there clear protocol as to how the state plans to handle the disposal and recycle of electric vehicle components? I'll go ahead and answer that question, Austin. Steve, thank you so much for your, um, for your question. Uh, we will be working closely with the staff involved with the development of the scoping plan to assess the issues that you're talking about. Also, I wanna mention that California through the RPS standards and SB 100 is working on cleaner grid to make sure that not only our vehicles are zero emission, but also that our 
power that it, they're powered by carbon free electricity. On the battery recycling thing, I just want to point out that the Cal EPA lithium ion car battery, car battery recycling advisory group, um, which is led by Cal EPA, is also being coordinated with DTSC and Cal Recycle. So we are definitely working with our partners on this and we'll be um, assessing this. Thank you, uh, Sylvia. Um, okay, uh, it says anonymous attendee. Are there plans in place to account for the additional load that this transition will place on the electrical grid that is currently at capacity in many areas? You know, again, we're definitely working with our partners to assess the load. Um, the PUs, I, I just want to mention that the POCs um, is actually working on addressing the evolving grid and that the um, Energy Commission is also developing recommendations. Um, and so we're going to be working uh, with them on these issues. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, thanks, Mark. I see that you have two more comments. Um, we, um, we've, uh, we've addressed, we, we recognize your comments and we are noting them and we appreciate them. And if you have any more, you, we, uh, recommend, we, uh, suggest that you can contact us after this meeting. We appreciate all your comments and your participation. Uh, Michael Murphy, while marginal non-attainment areas do not need to prepare an updated attainment plan, will the 2022 SIP nonetheless include a forecast of when those regions will attain the 70 PPB 808 uh, hour standard? Austin, I'll go ahead and answer that question. So um, one thing is that the marginal attainment date is 2020. So many of those areas that um, have a marginal attainment date um, have met the standard. For those of the that did not meet the standard, we will be developing state implementation plans for them. Um, everything in the statewide strategy applies to the entire state of California. And so any emission reductions that we talk about here will have benefits throughout the state. Uh, and another question, um, when will be the new SIP for adoption and implementation? So right now for this standard, um, the 70 PBB standard, the SIPs are due in August of next year. We are working with all of the districts that um, Austin had identified in that list to coming up with strategies to um, you know, provide for attainment. Again, you know, the requirement is that they're due on August 3rd. However, you know, each of them will go through their own separate public process as we're moving forward to ensure that um, they have the most expeditious attainment as possible. Sorry, I zipped through too quick and my share screen stopped. So I had to bring it back. Okay, um, thank you, Sylvia. Um, let's see. Uh, timeline, uh, Paula Tor Torado Plazas. I apologize for my laugh. <laughs> uh, timeline for community engagement is not clear. Are you all developing a community engagement timeline? Thanks, Austin. Yeah, I'll go ahead and answer that question. Um, thank you, Paula, for your question. Uh, we appreciate you are in being engaged and continuing to engage in this process. We um, will develop some more detailed timelines for community engagement. Obviously, yeah, we didn't have those kind of fleshed out to share today, um, but we do plan to continue to reach out to um, you know, the groups we spoke with recently, as well as other community groups across the state, um, you know, in the coming weeks, you know, we plan to um, circle back with everyone and kind of have that direct engagement as of course, as well as through this um, public process, um, through these future workshops and webinars that we will be holding. Um, but we will definitely um, get reach out back to you and the others um, that we will speak with and continue to have these conversations and share a more detailed timeline on um, that front. So thank you for your uh, question for your participation. Um, 
Let's see. Again, I think another question from Paula. Um, what about also targeting co-pollutants and air toxics that are also precursors to criteria air pollutants? I'll go ahead and answer that question too. <laughs> Thanks, Austin. Um, yeah, so to speak to that, um, you know, we are, of course, you know, the SIP as it is something that targets criteria air pollutants, you know, it is a plan that must be developed to meet federal clean air requirements for criteria air pollutants for, um, you know, namely ozone and particulate matter. And um, those are, you know, the precursors to those pollutants are the ones that we have to um, officially make commitments for, for SIP purposes, and um, that are required to be submitted into the SIP and, you know, for commitments for both emissions reductions, as well as uh, measures themselves. So we are definitely open to, you know, looking at measures that um, do provide toxics benefits, um, you know, and things that are, you know, definitely complementary efforts that can provide benefits, I think, on both sides, both on the toxic side, as well as on the criteria side. And so we're interested in looking more into, you know, all the effort that's being done with AB 617 with the community groups that have put a lot of time and effort into that process to see, you know, what strategies are being pursued in those AB 617 community emission reduction plans that have been developed and are being developed. And to see, you know, even if some of those measures were maybe developed to target toxics, how those can potentially fit into the state implementation plan as well. So that we're kind of just the beginning of this process. And so we're going to keep looking more into that um, and see how we can potentially incorporate those kind of things into the SIP here. Okay. Um, Michael Lewis has two questions and they're related to charts. Um, so the first one is, can we get a ROG chart similar to the Knox chart on page 31? And then can you produce the charts on page 13 and 14 going back to 2000, like your other charts? Um, I... So I think, you know, those, you know, it's definitely very important to show ROG and I, in our next workshop. And as we're moving through or forward through the public process, we'll, you know, add ROG charts of it um, right now. Um, you know, and we'll include that suggestion for our next workshop. Okay. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, I have another question from... Uh, it's already moved. I think um, this question was already addressed by Sylvia, but what is the plan for future battery and, ele and electrical waste? Um, I believe, Sylvia, your response earlier was a catch-all for that. Or, um, it, it, um, let's see, another one from um, Michael Lewis. Your CEQA analysis should include an exercise that looks at the air quality benefits of phasing out the oldest 20% of passenger and light duty vehicles on the road. You have phased out everything else in the state, but not touched the automobile. That ROG reduction would get South Coast AQMD back on track to control the ozone reading they have lost control of. Uh, I'll just speak real quick to that. Um, yeah, thank you for your comment related to the CEQA analysis. Um, you know, we will look at your comment and take that into consideration as we move forward. Um, we are looking at all, um, you know, potential effects, including, um, you know, all the strategies that we're going to be pursuing in the state SIP strategy. So we will um, take those into account moving forward. Thank you. Um, let's see, anonymous attendee. I understand the responses from Sylvia working with other agencies. When CARB is involved with these agency activities, the CPUC, the CEC, CalRecycle, DTSC, et cetera. Can we learn of opportunities for public engagement and comment opportunities, perhaps post on your site? Uh, thank you very much for your comment. You know, we'll, we are working with other agencies and, and such, and so we'll definitely uh, take your comment into consideration. And then I have another one from, I have a question from Todd Campbell. The vehicle incentives are broken. 
Steve Cliff promised to help fix this. We accepted, and to this day, there is no resolution for Carl Moyer two years later. We are on the same side. We can talk and chew gum at the same time, and we can build RNG and hydrogen fueling stations. Can CARB help us convince fleets and independent order owner operators that low NOx trucks are a solution? Can you incorporate these items in regs? Need outside the box thinking folks. Oops. Sorry. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Todd, for your um, comment. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're at the starting point here of the stakes of strategy. And so we will definitely consider your comment. Um, trying to see what questions we have left. Um, okay, another one from Todd Campbell. Just because the governor mandates its uh, mandates drayage, Sam, it does not mean the technology will be ready. What is your backup plan, and when do you think California will ever get to clean air? My prediction is no time soon, if ever. Thanks, Todd, again, for your comment and engagement. So um, with respect to the zero emission technology availability, especially for drayage trucks, currently there are about six vehicles, uh, six vehicle models that are available in HVIP. I mean, those include from various manufacturers like smaller ones and, and, and some of the major ones like Peterbilt, Freightliner, Volvo, Kenworth that are uh, that are planning to produce uh, zero emission vehicles, um, zero emission class A trucks with ranges um, and electric ranges going from 150 all the way to 250 miles. And we are seeing a lot more announcement in the next few years of zero emission trucks. I mean, either hydrogen or battery with longer ranges. So the technology is evolving rapidly. It's very promising that we will have the zero emission class eight and, and smaller trucks available uh, in the next few years. Um, part of this is, is the battery technology has been, um, has been improving rapidly. Um, obviously, we are looking at a technology development and, and our regs are, are, are driven by the technology, by the readiness of those technologies. We'll look into the technology readiness as we're developing these regs and the stringency of the regs will re be reflective of where the technology is and how it's going to be uh, developed over the next few years. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so there are. Um, so the next question is anonymous. Sorry for the delay. Uh, the anonymous attendee. Um, and it looks like Brian might have a follow up to it as well. Um, Governor Newsom with CARB and CDFA and the California Natural Resource Agency are promoting nature-based climate smart solutions. CDFA has awarded a sweep grant to use refinery carbon dioxide emissions to increase yields and water utilization efficiency, both by over 40% using free air crop, excuse me, using free air crop carbon dioxide enrichment as called FACE, as research, researched by USDA for over four years. Will CAR promote broader application of FACE with the CPUC so large power, power plants surrounded by orchards can be considered for grants? Um, Brian also has a follow-up about bio sequesters um, for carbon dioxide and uh, crops. I'll go ahead and um, answer that question. So, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we are definitely working with our partners here, um, you know, at CARB to 
um, our scoping plan team to assess the you know different types of things and we'll also be um, working with C, uh, CDFA to look at the potential benefits um, from the SWEET grant and the and the um, especially when it applies to things surrounded by orchards and et cetera. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, I believe that is all the Q and A, um, and then um, there are no hands raised. So I, I think with that, um, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, sorry, one second. Um, so thank you everybody. Um, that's all we have for today. Uh, we appreciate your participation and we look forward to working with you over the next year as we develop the 2022 state strategy. Um, thanks everybody. Have a great night and take care.